Hello, vets, and welcome to Veterans Nation. I'm your host, Trevor Scott, here with the ladies of Veterans Nation, Kelly Smith and Michelle Ladd. Hoorah! This segment of Veterans Nation is dedicated to the 2nd Armored Division. They're also known as Hell on Wheels. Whoa! <laughs> the, they played very important roles during World War II and most recently in the Persian Gulf War, but were deactivated in 1995. From Washington, D.C., this is from the Washington Free Beacon. Former Staff Sergeant Clinton Romache recently received the Medal of Honor from President Obama for heroic actions during a day-long attack on combat outpost Keating in Afghanistan. More than 300 Taliban attacked Keating early in the morning of October 3, 2009, from all four sides and from higher ground. Armed with recoilless rifles, rocket-propelled grenades, mortars, machine guns, and rifles, the Taliban swarmed the site, occupied by only 53 Americans and two Latvians. A score of Afghans stationed there had abandoned the site. Mortars hit Keating every 15 seconds during the first three hours of the attack. The Taliban breached the site and destroyed 70% of Keating with a fire. During the day-long attack, Romache showed conspicuous gallantry in taking out an enemy machine gun position, calling in airstrikes that killed 30 Taliban fighters, laying down covering fire to allow three soldiers to run to safety, and scrambling through a fusillade of enemy fire to recover the bodies of fallen American soldiers. Wow. His bravery, the president said, helped prevent the outpost from being overrun by Taliban fighters. He was wounded in the neck, shoulder, and arms by rocket shrapnel. Eight American service members were killed in the October 2009 battle, one of the most intense of the war. Before draping the medal around Mr. Romache's neck, the president recited the former sergeant's own words to the audience. He said, we weren't going to be beat that day, the president quoted him as saying. You're not going to back down in the face of adversity like that. We were just going to win, plain and simple. Mr. Romache is the fourth living American soldier from the Afghanistan war to receive the Medal of Honor. He now works for an oil drilling company in North Dakota. Wow. Congratulations to uh, Clinton Romache. Well deserved. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I watched that when it was on the news and it was... Yeah. Almost brought you to tears. Yeah, well, yeah. just like reading this. People do. It's just we talk it's about really stepping up. Of. It's really, you know. But that's that's the metal that mm. these soldiers yeah. are made of. Yeah, admirable. Yeah, right. Well, while we're on the subject of Medal of Honor recipients, I have a video I would like to roll. Uh, if you, it's been around a while, so if you have seen it, it's just a good reminder of a soldier's commitment and bravery. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth the view. Right. Rolling on the three shell. Thank you. 
Pretty amazing story. All right, we'll be right back. When America called, you came. Now you are being called again to join your comrades in service to one another, to help the families of those who have not returned, and for those who still serve in harm's way. Join your local VFW. Your fellow veterans need you. Go online to vfwil.org. Join the VFW. Your country is calling you back. And we're back. Hello, Here Rick. Here comes Rick, Rick. Simmons. Hello, team. What's going on, Rick? How we doing? That was a great video. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the Roy Benavidez story, that, that's legendary. That's legendary. I mean, you know, you can talk to any 
Special Forces soldier, anybody at Fort Bragg, or you know, pretty much a lot of Vietnam veterans. They know the story, and uh, they honor his name. They really do. Wow. Understandable. Yeah, yeah I yeah. believe it. Yeah. Rick, I've got a question. I've always wondered this about the Vietnam War, and I ask because, you know, I served in, in a combat infantry unit of, you know, well-trained, all-volunteer soldiers. But I just wonder, how did we get through the Vietnam War with a combat force made up of almost entirely draftees? I mean, how did that oh, work? Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's a good question. That's a very good question. And, uh, and I, myself, being one of those who, who you're really speaking about, a, a draftee of the Vietnam War who uh, ended up in combat infantry. And, uh, but, I, but I can understand why you asked it because, I mean, that war was pretty much over by 1973. And were you even born in 73? <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I can see why that's not understood, particularly by the, uh, the younger soldiers, um, who, like yourself, all you've ever known is a well-trained, all-volunteer army. Right, right. You know, they so, all chose to be there. Yeah, so, so it's, it's hard to fathom, you know, especially you being in the modern 101st Airborne, yeah. you know, very tight outfit. Well, I give you some answers. Uh, first off... Uh, if you go back to our military beginnings in 1950, all the soldiers there from, from 1950 into the late 50s were all regular army. I mean, there was, you know, command, there was advisors, there was uh, support troops. They were all, you know, regular army. A lot of them... You're talking about in Vietnam? In Vietnam, yeah. We, we, we started there in 1950 in a very small, minute way. But uh, they were all regular army. Uh, and then, you know, it wasn't until it escalated that we uh, started needing more troops, you know. Like, uh, for instance, most of us between the ages of 18 and 22, once the war started to escalate, we saw it coming. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, everybody had to register, everybody, you know. and. Unless you were a college student or a, uh, you know, family father of, 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 with a wife and kids, you know, you were, uh, your chance of getting called were excellent. Excellent. Yeah, probably the only other thing that would keep you out would be a bad police record. Because they were even taking them with minor police records. You know, that didn't matter. Um, now, another thing. We also knew that if we enlisted, we were going to be in for three years, whereas a draftee was in for two. And if you enlisted, the, 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 the Army, pretty much, would sort of, sort of guarantee that you could choose your MOS. So that was attractive for a lot of guys. So those guys were not draftees. So that eliminates mm -hmm. anybody who enlisted in the Army, Navy, mm -hmm. Air Force, Marines mm -hmm. to get take three or more years, but do what supposedly they wanted to do. And I say supposedly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of got shuffled around a bit. But uh, uh, as far as Army draftees, um, we knew that if, if we got drafted, we were most likely going to be infantry, and we were most likely going to Vietnam. Mm. We accepted that. You know, so what does that tell you? Were, were the guys who enlisted, were they taking the soft road and the draftees were just holding out, knowing they were going to go anyway? Does that mean we were stupid or, or, or foolish or maybe we were courageously foolish? I don't know. You know, could, could have been any it's of those. It's a fine line. <laughs> fine line. Uh, you know, we thought, hey, you know, if they really need me, I guess I'm going to go. I mean, I remember the day I got my draft notice, I was... I was on the road with some show, and I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and I, I, I called my dad on the phone. My draft notice literally caught up to me on the road. The post wow. office was tracking me down everywhere Jeez. the show went. That's crazy. Yeah. And I, I, I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I got my draft notice. I said, what should I do? And just as I remember asking him what should I do, I realized I'm asking this to a World War II vet that <laughs> yeah. spent four years in the yeah. Pacific, yeah. and he says, I guess you're going to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm going to mm -hmm. go. Uh, and then there was a 
considerable number of us holdout guys who actually volunteered for the draft. And you could do that. You could say, okay, take me. But you were still only going to get the two years. Uh, you, you were basically volunteering for infantry in Vietnam. Mm. But you still were getting the two years, and it, maybe it suited your life schedule at that point. Mm. It's like, guys, you know, 19, I got no job. Let's just do it now and get it over with because they're going to get me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and the recruiters loved those guys because that was an easy infantryman, right? Mm. We're giving him two years. He's going to be a grunt. Done deal. He made it easy for us. We didn't have to go, go draft him, right? Yeah. Sign him up. Now, let's call this number four, all right? No matter what the case, no matter how you became a draftee, you knew what you were in for. I mean, it was, like I said, there's no getting around it. When I got off the bus in my civilian clothes, hair still long, at Fort Benning with all these other draftees, we jumped off this bus, and there stood this drill sergeant with his smoky hat on. He was about six foot six. His name was Sergeant Hartwig. He was an E7, and he had a scar from here, across his nose, across his mouth, and all the way down his neck. And he growled. <laughs> and he goes, how many of you guys are U.S.? U.S. meant drafty. If, you're, if your service number began with a U.S., you were drafty. If it began with, a, if it began with an R.A., you were regular Army. Oh, he goes, how many of you pieces of shit are U.S.? Well, every hand went up. And he says, well, here's how it's going to be. You're all going to go to Vietnam, you're all going to be in the infantry, and you're all going to die. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's what he's going to tell us, you know. And, and, uh, and there's more. Uh, I remember, you know, during our first week in basic training, they're trying to sell us on taking that third year, turning us uh. into regular army. Hey, you can have this MOH. Oh, your test scores were good. Oh, you want to be a helicopter pilot? Warrant officer? Sure. Uh, four years. Uh, you got four years. You want to go to OCS? You know, and everybody's going, oh. Right. 90% of us just said, you know what? Give me the two years. Give me the gun. Send me to Vietnam, and let's just get this over. I just want to get out in two, yeah. you know? So there again. Because we didn't re-up, because we didn't take the three years, and we stuck with infantry, MOS, does that mean that the draftees were really the guys that had the balls? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Now, here's another one. Once we were assigned to our fate, once we started into training, we knew we were going to, you know, we, we just looked to our DIs and we thought, you know, if we're going to go, we damn sure want to learn how to fight. We learn, want to mm -hmm. learn how to fight good because we want to come home alive, you know. And the DIs, many of which were Vietnam combat vets, they trained us hard. And, and, and I, I really felt like they had a compassion for us. You know, we weren't just these, you know, maggot drafty piece of shit things, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that, like they told us we were. Mm -hmm. You could see, you could feel it. They really wanted us to train well because they wanted us to come back alive, period. Yeah. You know, they knew we didn't really want to go in the first place. But So now, here's number six, and this is, this is really the big one. Sergeant Hart was right. We all did go to infantry school. We all did go to Vietnam, and we all ended up in forward combat units. Uh, and once we were there, then we were... FNGs, you know what FNGs stood for, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you better learn quick, kid, because if you're going to be with us, we don't want you getting us killed. So you better learn fast, and we did. And you know, despite the unbearable environment there and everything else, uh, the word draftee to us had pretty much didn't exist anymore. We were soldiers. Mm -hmm. We were soldiers, and we were there to, to get it done. And then once you witnessed your first booby trap or, you know, first round fired at you, you knew it was real and you knew it was going to be a very long, real year. And there you go. That was it. And, uh, and then you made friends, you made comrades, you know, you kind of had that bond. You fought side by side and, and, uh, 
as you guys know, you know, eventually you become battle tested and then you become battle hardened. And let me tell you, man, I don't think there's an NVA or a VC from that war that was ever pleased to see a bunch of pissed off young American kids coming his way, armed to the hilt and getting crazier by the day. No, he did not like that. And uh, we won, you know, just about every battle we had there. Just about every battle we had there, we won. But it was, uh, damn it, it was, it was our government and our press and our public that fought poorly and let us down. Agreed. Yeah. Well, so mm -hmm. there it is, Trevor. It's an interesting perspective. Yeah. I, never, I never thought about it. Yeah, and, it, and I think I speak for just about every Vietnam vet that was a combat draftee. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's still that commitment. There's still that training. There's still that mentality. There's still yeah, right. everything that goes yeah. with it and that comes home. Yeah, well, you know, you. once you're resigned to knowing you're yeah. gone, yep. then that's it. You're a soldier. It yep. yeah. doesn't matter yeah. how you got there. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think that was my biggest concern was that, you know, forcing guys into combat I didn't want to be there. But I guess once you resign to the fact that you're going, yeah. you better train and you better be prepared. Now, there was one interesting and very small exception to all this. When we got in country... You usually spend about a week of in-country training before you were assigned to a forward unit. And a very small percent, maybe maybe one in 20, what's that, 5%, these guys just start twitching and mumbling to themselves and, and you know, getting goofy. And, and I saw this happen to a guy that I went through a, AIT with, and he was fine all through AIT, <laughs> but now he's in-country you know, and he's saying weird shit and mumbling. Well, the, the NCOs pick up on that. Mm. And guess what? They hold them back. They don't send them to the field. Mm. You know, they give them a desk job. And they go, okay, right. this guy's messed up. Right. So there was, there was a, a, a good bit of a screening. Right. There, right. a last-minute screening, process, you know. Yeah. <laughs> last-minute screening, which, which, you know, I think worked. <laughs> but uh, that's the story, guys. Wow, mm. good story. It's a good one. Thanks. Well, yeah, it's, it's great. Good question. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for that insight very much. My pleasure. So this is Veterans Nation again. Thank you. Welcome home. Welcome home. And we're out. Everything. We'll get into something real nice, you know.